Hi, my name is Paul Grogan and welcome to episode 34 of the Gaming Rules podcast, where I talk about the games that I've been playing and various other things that I've been up to. Joining me as a special guest in this episode is Jamie Stegmeyer from Stonemeyer Games, talking about all the plans that he's got for 2016 and some cool news about the new game that he's just announced. Lewis Holt, a good friend of mine, is also joining me to talk about the games that we've been playing. Thanks to everybody who's been active on the BGG Guild, especially in response to my last question about how to pitch board games to people who are not gamers. This is something that I'm going to be doing a number of times this year, so if you do have anything to contribute on this, it isn't too late. The BGG Guild is 2258 and I really appreciate your input. There's also going to be another question for the Guild later on in the show. Thanks as always to the sponsors of the show, Gameslaw, the UK's largest specialist games retailer at gameslaw.com. What Paul has played. First of all, a warm welcome to Lewis Holt, who's been on the podcast before, back here in episode 16, when we both interviewed Richard Breeze. So welcome again to the show, Lewis. Hi, Paul. Thanks very much indeed. And this time I've not lost a famous designer before coming on, so this is fantastic. Oh, yeah, it was the uh, it was the Columpton treasure hunt where we'd, we'd <laughs> lost Richard Breeze in Columpton. Yes, I, re- <laughs> I remember that now. Oh, yes, yeah, so at least I haven't lost Jamie this, this week, so no, this, is, no, this no. is awesome news. So. <laughs> I- <laughs> So I've had another great couple of weeks. I've been playing a lot of games. So I'm not going to talk about everything that I've been playing here. And also, we both attended a whole day of gaming put on by friendly local game store Meeple's Corner and friends of the show as well. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is a Pandemic Legacy update. Now, this is spoiler free. We are still on a roll with this one. We have just played another three games recently and won all of them. So we're currently in September, and the tally is eight wins and one loss, which I think is pretty good going compared to other people. I know Tom and Joel are playing this, and I don't think they've had that amount of success. No, I've, I spoke to Joel last night about this and, and right. he, he's sitting there scratching his head at your, your winning streak <laughs> as well. So, <laughs> I think the group is pretty good. I mean, we don't, you know, we are, we're having a lot of fun playing the game, but we are taking it seriously we're actually sitting down and going right this is a puzzle how are we going to solve this and we're really sort of talking things through we're still only taking about 45 minutes to an hour to play a game so it's not like we're you know we're lengthening it all but yeah we are we are pretty good the game at this stage without giving any spoilers away you are not just playing pandemic 12 times after the end of each month certain things happen you open a box you read some cards and certain things change and where we are now playing the game you know, Pandemic is a good sort of, you know, family plus gateway type game. What we're playing now isn't because there's all kinds of extra knobs and whistles and rules thrown in and everything else. And it's actually become quite thinking. There's definitely a lot going on. So what about you? Have you got any intention to play this, Lewis? I need to have um, a regular set of gaming people that you I do. can play with. Um, yeah. I'm not going to play this randomly or own it and then play it with different people each time. Um, there's a couple of guys who play down at Meeple's Corner in Crediton, um, Sarah and Nick. Uh, yeah. There's another two there, and they're not too far from me. So there's two there that I might try and maybe drag into maybe joining up and, and getting this. We just need a fourth. Uh, there is somebody else who actually plays, uh, Christopher, who comes down. Uh, not Christoph, but Christopher, the other right, manager. Okay. Um, so hopefully, maybe we can organise something with them. Because I really, I, I was kind of lured into the legacy with um, with Risk Legacy. And so kind of Pandemic Legacy, much more my kind of thing with regards yeah. to games. So yes, I, I do want to. So I am avoiding spoilers. Yes. I am definitely avoiding spoilers. Now, I have something to ask about this. You're, cool. you're, you're a a rules man aren't you this is Mm -hmm. what you do yeah um can i ask what the rule says about cards in pandemic legacy and what you're supposed to do with them at certain points what what you're supposed to do with with the components themselves if you discard them are you supposed to tear them up oh yeah he actually says destroy these cards and so what are you doing with your cards so we we've got an envelope that says so can i can i ask you're not playing this game properly is that is that correct correct we're not playing it by the (laughs) rules of the game we we, we've house ruled it I'm quite glad, actually, because I I knew I didn't really want to do that. And it turns out the other players didn't want to do that either. And I know know we'd probably find it very liberating. I'm just surprised you haven't all taken it in turns when you had four of them, just to kind of take one each and do it all kind of as a... Yeah, it's interesting because the interview with Jamie, which is coming on after this section, was Mm -hmm. actually recorded two days ago, where I talk about this, this, this same thing. Um, so yeah, we're not, we're not ripping up the cards. So we're not playing by the rules of the game. 
slap wrist for me. Sorry, so. <laughs> I, I'm sorry to drag that one up. I apologise no, for right. dragging to that. So next up is Robinson Crusoe, which I've been spending a lot of time with this at the moment because I've got involved and I'm helping write the new rule book. And I think I was a good choice for writing this rule book because I didn't really know how to play the game. So what it meant is I got sent uh, the rough version of, of the new rule book, which was actually pretty good actually, but I've been going through it and really getting into the game. So I've been playing it, I think I've played it four times now, and every time I'm coming across, oh, how does this work? Finding rules questions, looking in the rule book to see if we've answered it, and yeah, spending a lot of time with this one. So um, yeah, I'm, in, I'm enjoying it. I had, Robinson Crusoe was one which um, I had played once like three years ago, and it's been on my list of ones that I wanted to go back to to explore a little bit more, because I knew that there was a lot of game in there, and I'd only had that one experience with it. So it's kind of all happened at the right time. I borrowed Tom's copy off him, so I'm getting a, th uh, a few playthroughs of, of that one. Have you had a chance to play that? I, I, I won it in a mass trade for exactly the same reasons that you're right. talking about. It's one of those games where I really wanted to try it, and um, I won it in a mass trade, and I thought, it's one of those games that I can probably play with my boys yeah. um, because we, we're going to go through it and it's one of those things that every time I look at the rule book and I start reading up about it I know I've got to dedicate an evening of playing it solo to go um, through it yeah so I so I can ex so I can explain it better as to what will occur because there's lots of consequences and, and, and pros and cons of doing a certain action. You can delay various things. I'm aware of this. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's one of those things that I, I need to sit down and play solo and then be able to go through it with my boys. And I haven't yeah. had the chance yet to do it. So The basic, the basic gameplay and the basic mechanics are, are probably okay. Where it gets complicated is probably, oh, this token on that space means this. But if this token is over on that space, it means something slightly different. Yeah. Which, when you know the game, and obviously helping write the rule book and reading through it, to me that has now reached the stage where, well, that's obvious. But I can understand when explaining to others that this token does different things depending on where it is. It could be, yeah. could be a bit confusing. And but I, I don't want to sit there with a, a, a BGG thread open or, or the, the rule book no. my, because my kids have got the attention span of a gnat when you're playing you certain games. You probably will so. with the rule book because it's not a simple game. So, uh, I mean, I'm still referring to the rule book now and I've, I'm four games in. Right. So you, you probably will have to have the rule book handy. But yeah, I mean, next time you're over, if you want me to, to run through it, I'm, I'm more than happy. Done deal. So Robinson Crusoe. Next up, Warhammer Quest. Now, as some followers know, I've tried to play Mistfall a few times and failed. I think the rule book is a bit of a disaster, putting it lightly. Um, and it for me, it's really got in the way of actually trying to learn how to play the game. I found it not an enjoyable experience. I've tried it three times now, got it out, set it up, tried with the rule book and just not, it's just not working. Now, I posted this on Twitter a few weeks ago and somebody suggested that they, somebody who had the same issue with the game and they said, look, if you want a game that scratches that kind of itch, check out Warhammer Quest adventure card game. And I thought, well, that really doesn't sound like my kind of thing at all. But I looked into it a little bit. I thought, oh, well, I'll give it a go. Now, you, Lewis, and regular listeners will know how I feel about dice in games. I even wrote an article about it on the <laughs> Whose Turn Is It Anyway website. And the Warhammer Quest Adventure card game has dice for resolution of combat, and it has all of the usual fantasy flight games, assorted decks, which are drawn at random. So you draw in random locations, random monsters, random equipment, random items, all of those things. You put all them together, and that's the kind of game that is really not my cup of tea. But after reading the rules, I was like, oh, okay, this, this action system is actually quite nice. And the way that the game structure works, I thought, I'll give this a go. And three of us sat down to play it for the first time, and I absolutely loved it. I think I accepted the fact that it had all of those factors in there. And because it's a cooperative game, it kind of, kind of doesn't matter. You know, if you're playing, if you're playing a competitive game and you draw a card and it says, oh, well done, you've, you've won 200 pounds at a beauty pageant, for example. And then another player comes along and draws a card from the same deck and says, oh, you've crashed your car, you owe 2,000 pounds in whatever. It's like, well, that's completely random. But if it's a cooperative game, it kind of doesn't matter because you know if somebody gets hit for something, the group has been affected rather than just that one player. So, I've played it a few times since, uh, and I've taught a few other people how to play as well, and I'm actually really enjoying it, as it, even though, as I say, it's got all of those things in there that is normally not the kind of game that I like. 
Now, you've not had a chance to try this one yet, have you? No, no. Um, I, I simply just haven't had the opportunity to, so yeah. no. Well, it's not been out. Well, so it has been out for a few months, but I didn't know anybody else who had it, and I've, I've only just recently got it. Um, now, so why I like it so much at the moment, I'm like four or five plays in, is although it's got all these random bits, the way that the characters interact, it is a cooperative game, but the characters aren't just, right, we're all working together to try and accomplish this goal. The way that the actions work I mean you've really got to think about what you want to do. And the choice is, for me, unlike a lot of other sort of adventure card game type things, they don't seem obvious. So to give you an idea of, of how the characters work together, I have one action, for example, which is the aid action. And basically what I do is I use my action to give you tokens, which means when you do your action, your action will be better. And that's a really nice mechanic and it works really well. So, you know, if, if you're the fighter, you're just about to go into a, a big fight or whatever, mm -hmm. I will aid you, give you some success tokens, which means when your attack action is done, it becomes more powerful. Whereas my attack action might be really weak. And it's just the way that the characters sort of work well together. Really, really like it. My only downside on the game is that I like games that have customizable difficulty settings and this doesn't. It has, here's the quest, it is difficult, off you go. There's no you know, suggestions of, oh, here's how you make it a bit easier and here's how you make it a bit harder. And it would be easy to do. You know, you could start the characters with a bit of extra health or a couple of success tokens. I was gonna say, do you, do you not have, is there no leveling up with inside the actual system itself from, from Mission to Mission? So does, do you not get that as a? Yes. Could you, could, you, yes. could you not house rule a little bit of that? Yeah, what I'm saying is that there's lots of ways it could be done. Mm. And you could just say every, every character starts with one success token on a skill of their choice. Right, there you go. You know, mm -hmm. you can do that. Because mm -hmm. um, I know if you have games that are difficult, like Robinson Crusoe, Ghost Stories, and things like that, if you know, the, the game should have wide appeal. So if you're a hardcore gamer, you'll play it two or three times and you'll get better at it and then you'll be able to beat it. If you're not a hardcore gamer, you're never going to win the game. And it can be demoralizing. So... By, by, making, by, by setting the game on its easier difficulty setting, suddenly those players that are getting frustrated by the game because they never win, suddenly might be able to win. Yes, it's on the easy setting, but at least they've, they've had the victory. So again, it's, it's my only downside of the game that I can think of, and a lot of games don't have customizable difficulty. It's just one of the things that I, uh, I really like in games. Um, so Games Law were kind enough to give me a copy of Warhammer Quest Adventure Card Game to do a review. I might end up doing a full review of it at some point. So if you do like the sound of the game, look into it. Uh, Games Law do have them still in stock, I think, probably, maybe when you're listening to this. If you do decide to buy it from Games Law, please mention that you heard about it on the Gaming Rules podcast. Can I ask a quick question? Just a quick question yeah, about this. Because you have an aversion, is a nice way of putting it, to the um, Pathfinder Adventure Card Game. Absolutely, yeah. So, so what, what's, what's the difference between the two? Pathfinder, for me, has a really, really good character creation system and the way that the cards work and they move around and they're sort of your life. And that system was really good. But at the end of the day, Pathfinder, for me, was choose one of the locations to go to and each location was a pile of cards. Mm -hmm. So you just choose one. And then you turn over the top card and if it's a sword or some kind of item... You roll the dice to see whether you can pick it up or not. If it's a trap, you roll the dice to see whether you avoid it. And if it's a monster, you roll the dice to see whether you kill it. Right. right? And then that's pretty much it. And you do that and you keep repeating that until you've gone through the decks. And then I think when you've only got one or two decks left, you go and fight the bad guy. And that's it. The game mm. was turn over a card and then roll the dice to see what happens. Right, okay. Now, I know Pathfinder is massively popular, so I, I, you know, I know I'll come into some stick for saying it, it's not that <laughs> for good. For belittling it again that I way. I was yeah. so disappointed by, by, by that game. I think, I mean, it's massively popular. I think a lot of role players will play it because it's not a role playing game, but it sort of gives them the role playing game buzz. But I was hoping it would be a little bit more like a role-playing game, hmm. not just turn over a card and then roll a dice. Um, yeah, very, very disappointed in that. So, okay. you know, when I when I looked into the Warhammer Quest one, I thought, hang on a minute, is this going to be another Pathfinder? Yeah. Um, watched the review from Joel Eddy, drive through reviews, uh -huh. and he was like, yeah, this is really good. And I thought, right, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get that one. Okay. And I'm glad I did. Okay.
So enough about some of the games I've been playing. What have you been up to? Uh, one of the games I was fortunate to play at the Meeple's Corner that tabletop day was mm-hmm. a game called World of Yoho. Yes. Um, Joel, um, uh, right from Dev and Dice, he was one of these, come on, let's play this, play this. We've all got smartphones. And when I say yep. smart, I mean we've got an Android or an iOS phone because it doesn't work on Windows phone. Um, so we hijacked the um, pub's Wi-Fi and it's a good 440 meg download for this, for this, uh, wow. for this game. Now... Let me just break this. Let me just take a step back here. The game is basically a large board, a map of islands, and you are a pirate, and you're going to be sailing your ship around these islands, completing quests, plundering, adventuring, and generally having a pirating time. And I'm saying it lightheartedly because I think it is aimed at a very lighthearted yeah. kind of game. The, the, the characters you play are animals. The ships you play are kind of animal-based, and then they have various traits. But... Whereas normally there might be a card or a token that would do this, you're actually downloading an app on your phone and you're going to play this on your phone. Okay. And you lie it flat on the board and the, the grid, the board itself is gridded out in very uh, fine dotted lines where it is a rectangular shape and your phone will fit within that. Uh, the game, once you've downloaded it and installed it, you, you set yourselves up and say, I want to be this character, I want to be that character, like you would on any app of a yeah. smartphone. And then it says, put it on this square or this rectangle, uh, this place marker, and it gives you a grid reference like A2 or or whatever. And that's your starting port. Um, It then asks you to choose some missions. It then asks you, okay, you're in the port, what what kind of things you want to buy, you know, like what cannons and this kind of stuff and upgrades you might want to do because it gives you some starting money. And then you start this game of, of going around these islands. And what was really unusual was you'd move the phone up, down, left, right, orthogonally, because uh, that's how you would move it, and the app would know you were going in that direction and yeah. know which which square or rectangle you were going to next. Um, I was playing it upside down, so when I would move it towards <laughs> Joel, the app would kind of go, oh, you're going up, and then promptly move it towards me, I oh, upside down. Okay. So I, but what was good about the app, it took me a turn to realise this, what was good about the app was you can actually say, no, 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 I'm going the other way. And you click a button, and it goes, right, you're going that square. And it, it gives okay. you the layout, and you can change it. So the app itself was very good um the game itself was very light-hearted i think it's definitely aimed at a, a family kind right. of environment because when you fight you put the phones next to each other and you you basically set up a sequence of uh, events i'm going to fire this cannon then i'm going to have the the chain balls that that takes down the mast and then i'm going to fire some barrels of flames over at him then I'm, and you, you set up five or six of these in a row you put the phones back down again and say play and then you watch on the phones as the barrels and the fires and the catapults and all the rats are firing at each other. Okay. And it g- gives you the outcome of, of that battle. So you pick up your phone, yep. program your attack in things in yep. secretly, and yep. then put them down and they fight. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Absolutely. So that in itself, it was very fun. Uh, when you're moving around on the board, there are kind of sea monsters that come out of the water and swim around you because it's all animated on your phone. Yeah. Um, and it was all very nice. And I'm going to say this. There was a Samsung S5, a Samsung S7, and an iPhone 5. Now, the non-technically minded was there's basically two Androids and an iPhone there, roughly costing about a grand's worth of phones. <laughs> <laughs> okay, an expensive so, game, then. An expensive game. But the uh, Mark, uh, a friend who you play with, um, yep. had the very, very nice Samsung S7, which is a new phone, and it has a, no edge. It's the curved edge, Yeah. and it made the game look fantastic. It, I, yeah, when I came over and looked at it, I was like, that really does make a difference. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but not to say that after my little S5 and, 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 and Joel's uh, iPhone 5 didn't look good. It did look good. And it, it does, it is very nice. And if you're used to playing apps on your phone uh, and you're used to that environment, this game just works. It, yeah. re- it really, I was really impressed with the app and the implementation and the game itself. And I think if you've got kids with iPods that have probably got, need an iOS big enough or new enough for it and, and iPhones and all the rest of it, I'm not going to say everyone's got them. They don't. Because, and here's the next good bit of this, this game. If you've only got one phone, you can play it, play uh, pass play. Is that what right. It? So you have markers and you have your ship. And you put them on the grid where your ship would be. And then you use your phone, uh, the, the individual phone, and you put it back on, you take your marker off, you put it where it is, and then you move it around as though you was, were okay. controlling your phone. When you finish your go, you lift the phone up, pass and play, give it to the next person, and put your marker back. Okay, so they've done it so that you can do Absolutely, that. absolutely. Okay. So, so here's, here's a question then. Um, you're saying that pretty much all of the game happens within the app, which is on your, yes. your smartphone. Yes. So in the box, you get the board. Mm-hmm. And what else? Some tokens that I was saying for the pass and play. Okay. But if you're not um, passing and playing, um, it's, the, it's the board. Oh, no, there's some sticky, there's some sucker things that you can stick onto your phone to indicate the type of ship and the captain you are. 
And that's it. Yep. So it's the board. Yep. So if I got a copy of the board. Yep. That's the game. Yep. And the game's free. The the app is free. Yep. Right. And the app is very good at teaching of the game. I believe there is a manual in there. Um, okay. I don't know. We didn't use it because literally, like all it's apps, it's all there. Yeah, yeah it you know, teaches you the through it. The first time you go into a screen where you're in the bar, it says, "Right, you can take a drink, you can take a seat, and this is how you do this, and this is this button, and this button, and this button." Okay. And and kind of guide you through every new scene, scenario, or location. This is how you would do things. Right. So this game's just come. I mean, it was a successful Kickstarter last year, but mm -hmm. the game's just come out, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a lot of talk about it last year. Uh, you know, it was that and Alchemist, which were the, the things that got people scared and saying, oh my God, apps are going to take over the board gaming world, mm. you know, and it's invading. And then this was one of the games that did it. Um, I have spoken to Mark about it and he said it was all very clever. The app was fantastic mm -hmm. in the way that it worked. He said the game's not a very good game. Correct. It's a very but, light game. But yeah, that's it. It's aimed at your, your, your light gaming fa uh, families games or something Most like definitely. that. Yep. So, if, if, um, you, if you had family round and yeah. um, they, they were sitting there with their faces buried in their phone, I almost guarantee this is an easy sell. Sure. What else did you get up to at the, uh, at the gaming day then? So, okay, a couple of other ones I wanted just to quickly talk about because I wanted to see what your thoughts on this actually were. Um, so, all, um, so Quadropolis and Automania. Yeah. Now, I, I'm going to put them together because they're very... F I'm going to use... A, this is a nice expression. They're very Fisher Price looking. The artwork yeah. on them makes them look very childlike. I'm not yes. just they're not childlike but they they look very childlike and very easy to play um, and I liked and enjoyed both of them and they are uh, they use another expression they're right in my wheelhouse of games they're not right. overly complicated they're very they lured me in with moderately nice artwork and everything and a kind of this looks easy to play or I'll give it a go but actually there's quite a nice game underneath on, on the on the both of them have you played mm -hmm. either I've not heard anything bad about Quadropolis a lot of people have been saying really good things about it and the same with Automania. Hmm. Um, and I, no, I've not played either of them yet. Quadropolis, I do need to play because everybody's talking about it. Hmm. Joel's, you know, Joel's got auto. Joel's got both of them. So, yeah, indeed, yeah. You know, it's just it's it's the usual case of time and not enough. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I've played the Automania and I played. Now they're not similar in in the in the, the their game as it were. Because one you're doing cars and one you're city building, but. I enjoyed both of them for very similar reasons of this kind okay. of game that you're playing against. You're playing, you're playing a game by yourself in to do your own thing because in, in the cars, you're building your own cars and in the city, Quadropolis, you're building your own city. But the interaction on the board or where the pieces are and where they connect and, and where you're putting tokens down to obtain those upgrades or cities or whatever it is, you're fighting with other people and doing people over and seeing what they're doing. So they're similar in a way with regards to this bo central board with a quad kind of configuration so you can choose pieces but yeah. you're doing your own thing on your own board and I, I enjoy both of them equally yeah very very okay. impressed yeah we really enjoy them cool. so i've played two nice-ish looking games would you like to tell me about a nice-ish looking game that you almost played um <laughs> yeah so i played quite a few games that day um i think i started off with uh, bohemian villages which was nice it was fairly short had dice in it but it was okay for a sort of light game uh I ended up two games of bruges that i played but yeah, the, the, the one game I did talk about, it was so shockingly bad that I wanted to stop playing after two rounds. So that's how bad it was. And it's been a long time since, since I've played a game that bad. It was Legends of the American Frontier. Now, for anyone who likes the game, I, I don't want to tell you that you're wrong for liking it. You know, <laughs> each, each to his own. But for me, this game was a total failure. Sure, it, it had a nice theme, it had nice artwork, and it had nice components. It did look lovely. But that's it. And I'm afraid for me, this is, because I have my opinions on Kickstarter, and this game is one of the downsides of Kickstarter, because I think if you put up a pretty game with a, with a cool theme, some cool stretch goals, it gets funded. And based on the gameplay that we experienced, this game should never have been made. Um, so what happened is, after two rounds of play, I, I wanted to stop playing. I thought, this is at least going to be another 90 minutes. This is the most awful experience I've had in a long, long time. And I said to everybody, I said, look, guys, there's one good thing about this game, and that is that I can drop out now because I'm absolutely hating it, and it isn't going to affect the game for anybody else. Because I don't want to be the douche that says, this game sucks, I'm walking away, and it screws it up for everybody else. Literally, mm -hmm. I could have left, and it wouldn't have mattered to anybody else. Turns out, everybody else was thinking the same thing, but nobody wanted to say it, and we all just stopped playing. The game, the game was 
just nothing really. You had a character, you had a few skill points. There was an interesting method at the start of the game where you draft these cards that build up your story. So you all draft four or five cards and it's like, oh right, I went to university at Harvard and then I had, the, and that gets me two knowledge skill. And then I, I was raised in the army for a bit. Oh, I've got one fighting skill, this down the other. So your character starts the game with this little bit of a backstory, which is basically cards with some text on and it tells you what skills you start with. And then what happens is on, on your turn, you choose which one of these spaces to go on. And then basically you, you play some cards from your hand, which have all got quite high values on. And then you draw random cards off the deck and whoever gets the biggest points wins. So your starting skills, be two, three or four or whatever, are fairly irrelevant, irrelevant when you're drawing cards of value seven, eight and nine all the time. Um, but yeah, basically if you, if you win, if you get the most, which is a, a complete look fest, um, you get the reward of the card and you get all the bonuses on it. And if you fail, you get to draw a card from this penalty deck and the penalties are huge. So it's like, hang on a minute. <laughs> the person who was lucky enough to win gets the bonus and everybody else who wasn't lucky enough to win gets this massive penalty. It just, it just didn't work at all. And then since then I thought, well, it can't just be me. Went on, read a couple of other reviews, saw a couple of other comments on BGG and went, yeah, okay. So as I say, it, it, it's been odd the last time that I played a game that, that was that bad. So this is gonna bring me to my question for my BGG guild. So when this podcast goes live, there will be a thread on my Board Game Geek Guild of what is the last game you played that was as bad as what I'm describing, where after a couple of rounds, you wanted to stop playing, and then it turns out everybody else wanted to stop playing as well. So uh, yes, send in your answers. What was the last game you played, Lewis, that was that was so bad that you, you, you wanted it to be over? Um, it's, prob it's probably uh, one that I like. I'm going to say it's probably a heavy Euro game. Um, <laughs> actually, well, you know what he's going into that. You, you know, you're good. You're going to a heavy Euro game, and you might not like no, it because it's a heavy Euro game. I get lured into game. these heavy Euro games by people saying to me they're easy and they're lovely and easy to play. You'll um, be do fine. You know what it, yeah. it was. It was um, a Council of Four. It was a Council okay. of Four. Now it wasn't. I didn't want to play this game. I the, the boys at Meeple's Corner were playing it, and yeah, and they played it a couple of times. Yeah, and, and one of the guys said, "I can't play. I've got to go." And, and this and the other said, "Do you want to take my place?" And I went, "Okay, fine. I'll, I'll sit down. I've played this. Let's, let's give this another go." And I quite enjoyed it, but halfway through the game. There was a definite sentiment around the table of, we do something, this happens, next person's go. I can't do anything, next person's go. I can't do anything, next person. I can do something, I've got cards, tickets to ride start, and, and so on. And you could almost get this reluctant sentiment of, can we just make this game end? Uh, and, okay, I thought and, people were enjoying it, but that was no, my, it my false it, perception. Uh, right. no, the, the, the enjoyment was the fact that we were mocking the game. Oh, okay, uh, right. Um, and it wasn't the fact that it's a bad game. It's just the fact of, of the way in which it was being played and, and the what people's thoughts on the game was before they entered to what they were playing was different I believe right. um, and I came away with it very similar in that kind of like there's a runaway leader not runaway leader issue but there's definitely a thing of once you see the ball rolling and people chaining things together you, yeah you know that person's going to win it because you can't stop them because of their every chain that they create so um, but you could that that the, the, the four of us that were playing, um, yes, very similar sentiment there. But it wasn't a, wasn't as horrific as your one. <laughs> even even Sarah came across to me and said, "Oh, never again! Thank God, Paul stopped it." <laughs> <laughs> so yes, that Frontiers game was actually quite bad, apparently. Uh, it, it was yes. Yeah. So let's end on, on a high note. Other things that I've been playing recently, I've dug Legends of Andor out because what happened on on Friday night there was four of us playing Pandemic Legacy and then three other people were going to come round and they'd mentioned the previous week about playing Legends of Andor. So I thought, well, I'll swat up on the rules again so that I can help them with it. Played a quick solo game of it just to, just to get my head around it. Then it turns out five people turned up on Friday instead of three. So they didn't play Legends of Andor. Um, they played Kemet instead. But I persuaded two of them to stay late because by that point I'd read the rules and I was very keen to play it again. I said, look, it's half 11 at night, but if you guys want to stay for a little bit more, we can we can get another game in. So we played it till one o'clock in the morning on Friday night, Bloody way hell. past my bedtime, <laughs> and we failed. And because the, 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 the mission is, is quite tricky to do. But we got into the situation where we were like, hang on a minute, is this even possible? You know, it, it felt so hard. So then what I did is I played through it again myself with the same three player configuration on the Saturday. So I'd played it like three times in the space of two days, although two of those were solo. Right. And it's another, I mean, I, this, this podcast, I've been talking about 
Legends of Andor, fantasy cooperative game with mm -hmm. dice rolling. Warhammer Quest Adventure Card Game, fantasy cooperative game with dice rolling. Robinson Crusoe, cooperative game with dice rolling. So I'm on a cooperative buzz at the moment. And considering four or five years ago, I was one of the people that were saying, oh, I don't see the point in cooperative games. They're a total waste of time. I think I've... I've you never got finally... over that BGG bug, did you? It's really you know, it's brought you down. <laughs> it's changed you. It, it, it's an appreciation which I never had for cooperative games in that they are not a complete waste of time. They are a thoroughly enjoyable experience with the right group. What, what's interesting also is you're actually involving your better half as well in a, in a couple of them. And that's, I think that helps. Uh, yeah, mainly in Time Stories. Uh, Vicky is still reluctant to get involved in other things. But today, I was playing through uh, a two-player game of Robinson Crusoe while Vicky was cooking dinner. So what happened is I was sat at the dining room table playing through a two-player game. She was cooking dinner. Instead of her you know, listening to the archers or watching Gilmore Girls or something like that that she normally does while she's cooking, and me being upstairs working on the next video, I went, no, I'll tell you what, we're not going to play a game today because we were out doing other things. So I'll sit and play it. And she kind of joined in. She never actually saw the game. She was in the kitchen. But I was shouting to her saying, right, it's your turn. Uh, I, we, we, these are the options. And, you know, I was going through it. And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. I'll, I'll go and do that. It's kind of playing the game together. No, that counts. <laughs> that still counts. That's fine. It, it, it still counts. It counts and, the same uh, way as I'm on the same podcast with Jamie Stegmaier. That, that's it. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> we will be on in the next section so uh anyway right so that's some of the games that we've been playing over the last couple of weeks and thanks very much for joining me on the podcast thank you for having me on again paul thank you cheers special guest so i'm very pleased to welcome to the show as a special guest jamie stegmeyer from stone meyer games first of all thanks for giving up some of your time to join me jamie paul thank you so much for having the flexibility to meet with me that's all right. Welcome to the, the Gaming Rules podcast. Now, I've had a few questions in from people on my BGG Guild, and I've got a few, few things to ask you myself. The first one is about Scythe, which is, I think, uh, officially, according to a BGG thread that I read, the most anticipated game coming out this year. Now, Scythe had a very successful Kickstarter, but can you tell us whereabouts the game's up to at the moment? Sure, yeah. So we're recording this on May the 6th, and right now we're in the final week of assembly at uh, Panda, our manufacturer in China. And so after that, Panda will send the game out to a bunch of different fulfillment centers around the world. It'll probably arrive there in mid-June. And uh, so backers, I'm anticipating if that freight schedule stays intact and if customs goes well, backers will get their games in July and we'll do a Gen Con and retail release in August. Right. That's good, because I'm going to be at Gen Con. Oh, awesome. So, so that, should, that should be good. Now, the, there is a friend of mine, and a friend of the show, Efka from the No Pun Included show, uh, whose copy of Scythe arrived this week. So he's making everybody jealous by posting lots and lots of pictures about it. Right, yeah. We, uh, so for any game that we make, we, I get a few advanced copies from the, uh, from the manufacturer. So I got one advanced copy of each version of the game, so I right. could look through it and make sure that everything was right. Um, and I don't need all those advanced copies sitting in my office, so I, I sent them out to a few reviewers. So Efka got one. We had arranged that a while ago. Rodney at Watch It Played uh, got yep. one. Um, and uh, uh, Nick at Board Game Brawl got oh, one yeah, as well. Yeah. So he's, he's working on his. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, and so idiots like me that didn't back the game, <laughs> Gen, Gen Con, it will be available for purchase at Gen Con and soon after that in, in normal retail outlets. It will, it will. It yes. Will. Yeah. So as for why I didn't back it, I've actually been asked, although I'm interviewing you, I've been asked some questions myself, um, which, is, which is why I didn't back it, and now's as good a time as any to explain it. So the, first of all, I don't back a lot of games on Kickstarter. I have a few friends that back loads of things on Kickstarter, and I've kind of shied away from it a little bit. I've been burnt more than once with games coming out in retail at the same time, sometimes even before, and sometimes for a cheaper price, you know, that, that tends to happen. So I tend not to back much stuff on Kickstarter in general. In principle, I really like the idea because more money goes back to the designer and the publisher rather than, you know, a lot of it being taken up by the middlemen. So I, I right. do like the idea of Kickstarter. The other thing about the game is that there was a lot of hype and it came 
it, it was all happening at a time when I was like working 80 hour weeks, hardly any time to sleep. And I just didn't have the brain capacity to go, right, stop, look at this, see if it's the kind of thing you like. So I saw all of the hype going on and I don't know why, but it kind of turned me off it a little bit. Because I think there's been a lot of games which have been overhyped recently, or in the last couple of years, which have turned out not to be that great. And I mistakenly saw all of that hype and thought, oh, well, it can't, it can't be that good, surely. And then came that live play of the game that Efka organised, and we did that, that live broadcast right. where I read the rule book and then played the game and was like, okay, this is amazing. Um, and basically took back, I mean, I hadn't said anything negative about it because I didn't, I didn't know anything about the game. <laughs> right. But at that point, I realised, okay, this one, the hype is real. I mean, for those people who don't know, for those listeners who don't know Scythe, that one who's, who's sat at home now who's not heard of Scythe, it, for me, it blended, it felt like a Euro game, but I could see that people who don't like Euro games would also like it because it's got... It's got the dudes on the map, it's got the combat, it's got other stuff, but the workers and the way that you build up your player board is so Euro. So I think it's just a brilliant hybrid, and I can see why, why all the hype's there. Well, thank you. Yeah, and yeah, the hype, hype was a, a fascinating thing for me to almost observe as a, you know, I, I'm part of the process, but I, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't telling people to go out and and generate hype for me, you know? No, exactly, um, yeah. So it's interesting to see that, because, and I can definitely understand where you're coming from. I've, I've had that same experience where I see a ton of people being excited about something and I'm like, no, I can't be, how can it be that good? Or, right, okay, it's not just me then. So. Right, oh no, no, I can totally <laughs> relate to that. But, you know, I'm, I'm, as you said, I'm, I'm hoping that people give the game a chance and get the chance to, to try it, whether it's their copy or a friend's copy, and then make an informed decision about whether or not they want to buy it. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, for those people who don't know, this, game started because of the artwork i believe that's right yeah, I, yeah. there's a, a website called kotaku that talks about mostly video games and they had featured jacob's art on that site and uh i just i fell in love with it instantly and wanted to design a game in that world i don't know whether that's happened before if it has i don't know about it um you know that you've seen art and then you, the art itself inspired you to then make the game that then included that art yeah, I'm not mm -hmm. aware of it happening. I, I'd love to do it again. Since then, I've kind of, <laughs> I've, I've kind of kept an eye out for an artist that's created a world of their own. Because you know, artists just have an incredible amount of creativity yeah. that goes beyond just designing art that people tell them to make. So that's kind of been on my mind since then. Yeah. So the so some of the original pictures that you saw on on this website are any of them included in the game, or is it all original art for the game? There are some that uh, from Jacob's original 1920s portfolio that have ended up in the game. Uh, the key, really, the key difference between then and now is that originally his world was uh, a fictional version of uh, a period, uh, kind of a war that took place between Poland and Russia. So it was just between Poland and Russia. And when I went to Jacob, I said, you know, I'd love to make this a multiplayer game or more than just two players. Can you? Can you build some other factions into this world? And that's where the other three factions came from. Right. Um, so the, the original art is only, you only see things where it's Poland versus Russia, and all the new art has other uh, factions. Has the there. other, right, gotcha. So, um, yeah, so I'm definitely going to be picking a copy of that. I mean, I've got friends who've backed it anyway, so there's going to be, there's going to be more than one copy in our playgroup. Mm -hmm. But it's just a game that I just want to have in my collection, definitely. And there's another game which you've announced recently, which is definitely going to be in my collection, which is Charterstone. That's right. Yeah, we, we just announced it a couple of days ago. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about that. So Charterstone, like you said, it, well, it's, a, it's a village building legacy game for one to six players. And it's uh, kind of the main focus of the game is you are um, you are assigned a charter, a small part of this new village, and it's pretty much a blank board when you open the game board. There's nothing on it except for a designated area for where you can build stuff. And the buildings you build are, they start off as stickers on cards, and you peel the sticker off the card, you put it on the game board permanently, and that becomes an action space that you and any other player can use uh, okay. through a worker placement mechanism. Yeah, that's the, the core idea behind the game. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely inspired a lot by what I played with Risk Legacy and Pandemic Legacy and even Time yeah. Stories. Um, and it's, uh, it's uh, oh, and I guess one of the other things about the game that's a bit unique is that 
I, I am designing it so that it can be played as much as you want after you've unlocked everything. Yeah, so this is one yeah. of the things that I was going to ask you about because yeah. it's been getting some discussion on BGG. The game, as it comes open, when you open the box, has got, I believe, 24 plays in it. And after the 24 plays, you reach the end of the campaign. But then you can carry on playing the game with that village that you've built, effectively. Exactly. Yeah. That, yeah. And it's... It, I've been trying to explain to people that it's not just... It's not a gimmick. It's not a sales pitch that you can do that. It's like it's a core element of the design that the game be replayable and fun after that point. And one yeah. of the things I didn't make clear um, in some of the early discussions is that throughout the entire campaign, you play as the same charter. Like the, if, you're, if your player color is red, you're always red. You always have the same area that you're building in. Okay. But, but when the campaign is over, after you've unlocked everything... It becomes a little bit more like a normal board game where you randomly are selected. Uh, your your player color is randomly selected at the beginning of the game, and your your right, charter yeah. is randomly assigned. So you get to play with a different area, some different asymmetry, um, and so that's that's a key element of how the game will 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 become play replayable in a different way after you've unlocked everything. Okay, so the game after twenty four plays after you finish the campaign is the kind of game that you would have just gone out and bought from a shop. Precisely, yeah. Yeah, exactly. okay, it's just you're playing the bit where you actually build up the village and decide what's what's where. Right. So, cool. So, yeah, um, Damien over on the Guild um, was interested to hear what you think is different about this from other legacy games, apart from what you've just discussed. Is there anything else cool and unique about it? Yeah, those are two of the main features. I mean, it's I, I've described it as an additive legacy game instead of a destructive legacy game. Well, that's that's music to my ears. Because <laughs> for Pandemic Legacy, we have an envelope, and written on that envelope is ripped up cards. Uh -huh. <laughs> because I can't... I mean, it's not even my copy of the game, but I can't bring myself to do it. The guy who owns the game can't bring himself to do it. Right. So we just put them in an envelope. And I know it's supposed to be liberating, and I will probably, <laughs> I will probably enjoy it if I can just get past it. But it's it's a bit scary. So hearing <laughs> that yours is non-destructive is is good. Yeah, that, that's a key element, and, and really, it's for I know it depends. Like you said, it depends on the player. Some players are okay with that. Some players aren't. For me, I'm okay with it. But for a game where you're building something, it just didn't seem right to also have destructive elements. Yeah. It's core yeah. The other thing that's a, a little unique. Um, like so, Pandemic Legacy is is probably the game that's on most people's minds right now is what a legacy game is. And in Pandemic Legacy, you follow a a plot that Rob and Matt cleverly designed and, and wrote out. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a television series that you follow that plot. Yes. In Charterstone, there is a core plot to it, but it unlocks uh, in like you're not following a, a sequential storyline. The players are determining how that storyline unlocks in a very different right. order for each copy. Okay. Um, I think we'll see some of that in, in Gloomhaven, the other upcoming Dungeon Crawl yeah. legacy game from Isaac Childress. Yeah. Um, but it's, well, yeah. Yeah, I'm involved in Gloomhaven. I'm the guy that's going to be doing the official rules video for it. So Ooh, awesome. Um, that's a yeah. daunting task. Uh, I know. <laughs> He's, he sent me the rule book. I've read through it twice, and I'm like, how am I going to turn this into a short <laughs> video? I don't quite know. Uh -huh. So Charterstone, it's in development. It's just been announced, so it's not going to be out in the shops next week. Right. The next stage is that you're going to be developing it for X amount of months, and then it will go on Kickstarter this year or next year? I am hoping for this year. It's... Not 100% sure going to be Kickstarter, but there will be some sort of pre-order campaign for it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what other plans have you got for 2016 then? Yeah. So we we kind of have a bunch of stuff that has been piling up right now so that it can be ready for a fall release. Um, those things, are, and they're all pretty much expansions. So uh, Tuscany is an expansion pack that we had released a couple years ago, but we're, I've kind of whittled it down to just an essential edition. Yep. So, um, so we are putting the finishing touches on what that is. There are no differences between that and the original Tuscany, except that it's less stuff. And so my graphic designer has to cut out all the original stuff. Sure. Um, okay. So we're working on that. Uh, I am still working as a developer with uh, the Euphoria expansion designer, Morton Monrod Peterson, who is usually our solo designer, but he's doing the design for Euphoria, the Euphoria expansion. So he's working on that. I have no idea when that'll be ready. It's kind of... It's taken longer than we thought, but we want to, we want to get it right before we yeah. release it. 
And then the thing that actually is way ahead of schedule is the scythe expansion, which is basically just two new factions that you add to the game that allows you to play up to six or seven players. Um, and that that we are will probably send to the printer in about a month and a half, maybe two months. So that will, oh, okay. as long as the miniatures stay on, on track, that'll be ready for a fall release as well. So that'll be coming out very soon after the actual game itself. It probably, it really depends on the miniatures because they, yeah. they can take a long time to, to make. We, but we are in the process of making the molds for them. So we're in a good place. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, another question in on the guild from Alexander. He says that Stone My Games, small company, doing a few projects a year, mainly via Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. Is this how you'd prefer to keep it going for the next few years, or do you see the company growing to be able to accommodate more games in the line? Yeah, this is something I think about a lot. Um, and it, as it stands right now, I'm I'm pretty happy with the 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 level that that we've reached in terms of how much stuff we release because i'm able to like i don't think charterstone would have gotten as much attention if i was releasing a new game every month right i like that that i spend a lot of time on one game uh and then release it and and people get excited about it and i can engage with them about it and then we do that for another game so we'll, we'll probably keep it pretty much the current pace for a while um, unless it really becomes too much for, for me to handle and I need to bring, on, bring in some new people. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's, there are advantages to that because you want to be involved in everything. So if you were to double the amount of games that Stone My Games is producing, you'd end up having to, you know, take on staff and then delegate more and then you'd lose a bit of the, of the control over certain things. And it maybe wouldn't feel the same. Yeah, that, that's one of my concerns. Um, but it, I guess one thing that will help that process, for example, what we do with Between Two Cities, which is a game designed not by me at all, mm -hmm. um, by Ben Rossett and, and Matthew O'Malley. And I served as a developer for it, which is still a fair amount of time. But yep. really, they were the kind of designers that, that I could I could play test at once. I could get a good idea of what was happening with the current version. I could send them some feedback, some questions, and then they would take it and play test it a dozen times or 20 times. Right. And so that, that process worked really well with me. So if there are other designers out there who have games that I fall in love with and want to work on as a developer, that's a way that we might ramp up production a little bit. But I, I, don't, I don't think we'll get to a point where we're making, where we're releasing more than two or three games a year for quite yeah. some time. And as you say, you know, if, you were, if, you're, if, you're only re, if you're only releasing two or three games, those games that you do release get, get a lot more attention. Right, exactly. So they're going to be they're going to be bigger games, which yeah. is uh, which is good. Okay, so that's all um, exciting. So going back to Charterstone, we finished our second game of Pandemic Legacy a couple of weeks ago. Our uh -huh. second session of Pandemic Legacy. We've reached the end of May, and we were we all started talking about legacy games, and we were like, right. So when we finish Pandemic Legacy, what are we going to play next? You know, because we're all like you know kids in a candy store with oh, <laughs> open this box or scratch off this bit. Right. So we're all we're all loving it. And we're like, well, what legacy game are we going to play next? So um, Seafall was talked about, mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to be coming out later this year. And then we started to talk about other ideas for legacy games, at which point I said what would be really cool is if there was a legacy game where you had this little village and it started off really small and then you gradually built it up over the game and then you announced Charterstone. So thank you very <laughs> much for listening to my demands, although you know, it was... Uh, it was a discussion between four people in a in a quiet room. I, I didn't realize you had microphones. Uh, I do in, in the house. Yeah, I, I have a, <laughs> at least a microphone and camera in every in every house. Every house games. in the UK. Yeah. yeah, I mean that would make sense. It was just funny. It was it was I think two days afterwards that you announced it, and I sent the link to everybody who was in the pandemic group and went, "Look, there you go." <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's so that, that's quite cool. So we've got one final question in from Tony Boydell, designer of Snowdonia, and he wants to know. If you will design him a scythe-themed scenario for Snowdonia. Now, don't worry, because he asks this to every <laughs> guest I have on the show. <laughs> well, Tony, I, I, I love that you asked that. It, I, a friend of mine has Snowdonia. I haven't played it yet, but I'd love to play it and, and see if that would be a good fit. That's uh, Yeah. I would yeah, love to. Us. In fact, while we were playing Time Stories, which, Paul, I know you're very involved with. Yes. It, it, playing Time Stories and having that the visual element paired with the story really wanted me really made me want to make a side time stories module right 
Um, okay. And as you, uh, yeah, I can't say anything without spoiling anything. No. <laughs> that, that won't happen, but it made me want to do it. Yeah. Yes. Well, never, never say, never say it won't happen. You never know. <laughs> Because there's a lot of people who are submitting new scenarios for Time Stories officially. Oh, cool. And there, there are okay. people who've, you know, because they released a kit on how to design your own and they've got a submissions thing and, yeah, they've, 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 they've got it in there and people are, are submitting them. Oh, that's um, awesome. It's just one of those things. I mean, me, me and my girlfriend, we've come up with a couple of ideas for settings which we think would be would be cool. Uh -huh. And I think as long as you've got a cool setting and a good idea behind it, then the framework is there within Time Stories for you, you to be able to do pretty much anything you want. Right. So right. in fact, I, I, I came up with something which was going to be unique for the one that I was going to create, sort of the unique selling point about it. And uh, I won't tell you what it is because they've used it in Under the Mask. Oh, so cool. they, they've obviously got microphones in, in my house as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's like every idea I had, somebody goes, goes off and, and does it, which is fine because I'd never get around to doing it myself. So, yeah, I'm glad other people have, uh, are doing it. So anyway, that's, that's pretty much all we've got time for. Is there anything else you wanted to add in to tell people what, uh, what's going on with Stonemaier Games? You know, I think that's pretty much everything that's happening uh, yeah. for the foreseeable future. Um, okay. Yeah, so I really appreciate the t you taking the time to talk, Paul. No, no, thank you for your time. I know, uh, I know things must be busy with, with everything. And um, yeah, really good to have you on the show. Thank you. Yeah. Gaming Rules News. The main two pieces of work in the last couple of weeks have been helping rewrite and edit the new rulebook for Robinson Crusoe, which I've mentioned a few times in this podcast. This is getting a new release later on this year. I don't think anything in the game itself is going to change, apart from some new components, um, but Portal Games are getting the rights back, so they're going to be doing a new Portal Games English version. I've also been working on the official rules video for Days of Ire Budapest 1956. The video's pretty much done, but it won't be going live until the Kickstarter launches, and I'm not exactly sure when that's going to be. Um, should be in a few months. Days of Ire is a game set around the time of the Hungarian Revolution of 1956, and plays either one versus many, or cooperatively. I'll be talking more on this when the Kickstarter launches, since I've also played it and helped with the rulebook and think it's a pretty cool game. And that's all I've got time for, so thanks again to the sponsors of the show, Games Law, uh, to Lewis Holt and for Jamie Stegmeyer for joining me, and to Jason Shaw at audionautics.com for the music used in this podcast. Take care, and thanks for listening.